Do not bend the needle. I repeat, do not bend the needle. If you bend this needle and you end up injecting into a patient, there is a very high likelihood that this needle is going to snap off into, no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just forget everything I've said in this opener because really, truly, this may be something that you were told in dental school. It might be something that you've thought or even just kind of picked up from being around the dental industry for a while. And the mindset of not bending the needle is something that you need to get out of. So there's really only three options when we're working on a patient to anesthetize them. One is if we need better access, we can move the head, position them better so that we can access the area better. Sometimes that's just not enough though, depending on where we're trying to inject. The second option that we have is to perhaps move the head and then we can contort our wrist or move our arm way out, kind of get into a little bit more of an awkward position where you're less in control of what you're doing. That's not necessarily ideal, but maybe it would work for you. But the third, and I would argue the simplest, and even in my opinion, recommended way of doing things is to put a bend in the needle. Now, just about every injection I do involves some form of bend in the needle. Now, is it a necessity? Like I said, no, but for me, it has made a huge difference. Now, if you're worried about this needle breaking off in the tissues, you should be because yeah, that could happen. If you do a Google search and you look hard enough, you'll find some pans with some needles buried in there by the ramus and you think, oh my gosh, that's not a good situation. And you're right, it isn't. But the likelihood of that happening is extremely, extremely rare. So we're gonna go through all the ins and outs of this within this video so that by the end, you're gonna be bending your needles like a pro and you're gonna to be totally comfortable doing so. Anytime that we're looking to bend metal and needles are no exception, we have to be aware that we're weakening the structure of the material. So as you bend the needle once, typically we're okay. You bend it back, probably still good. Third time, now we gotta to start to be a little bit more cognizant of you know, what we're doing. You will actually, and I encourage you to do this in your office, just grab one of these, bend it back and forth, back and forth. You will start to get a tactile sense for when this needle is about to come off. And when it does separate, it separates right here, which is the junction there of where the needle protrudes right from the hub. So it basically separates with nothing left there at the end. I will demonstrate this in this video. This is also one of the reasons that you're taught in dental school most times that you shouldn't be injecting with this buried all the way to the hub. Now there are some practitioners who will inject that way. They want to use a short needle for everything. Is it right or wrong? You know, don't really want to argue that. So it's one of those things where if you really want to err on the side of caution, make sure that you leave a little bit of this needle protruding. And the reason for that is Let's say that you're doing a IAN block, you know, things are going good and boom, you're right on point and you hit right by the nerve and the patient suddenly jumps. Now, if they're maybe very nervous or something beforehand, they might move quite significantly. And if you've been bending your needle back and forth, there's a chance, you know, maybe a low possibility, but it's still a chance that the needle will separate. And at least in those cases, if you haven't hubbed the needle, which again, you probably shouldn't be for your IAN block, but uh, if you haven't hubbed it, you're going to have a bit of needle still protruding out from the tissues, which then you can grab onto at the hemostat and remove safely. So it is something to be aware of and just to keep yourself out of a real sticky predicament, um, try to keep from inserting that all the way into the hub. It's now the moment that you've all been waiting for so desperately, <laughs> hopefully anyways the bending of the needle. I'm going to demonstrate to you just how many times you can go back and forth. Go ahead and take a guess before we get into this. I was surprised actually when I started doing this. Just I thought, oh, you know, you could probably bend them a couple times and, you know, they'll let go. These things are surprisingly durable. So we'll give it a go here. I'm going to bend it, you know, a generous amount each time, kind of back and forth, and we'll just count until we break off the needle. So I'll give it a bend. Now when you do bend the needle, and I'm bad for this because what I typically do is I'll just push with my finger just right above the hub and you just give it a little bit of pressure and it will tip the needle over. Now some people are going to look at that and they're going to go, oh you're contaminating the needle and you shouldn't be doing this. Yeah, technically you probably are, right? But how much contamination is there on the needle? The proper way to do this would be to use an instrument like some cotton forceps or something 
just to bend it without actually touching it with your fingers. But most of the time, I mean, we're not inserting the needle all the way up here to the hub, like I mentioned. Again, how contaminated are your gloves? Hopefully not too contaminated. You should be changing them frequently. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you'll be fine. So here we go. Ready, we're gonna do our first bend. So this is a pretty typical bend for me. I'll put in a bend kind of like that, sometimes even a little bit more pronounced for an inferior alveolar nerve block. That's number one. I'm gonna bend it back, same amount. Number two, three, four, you're getting nervous yet? <laughs> Five, six, seven. How much longer can this go, right? Like these things are supposed to snap off, they told us. Eight, nine, 10, 11, this is actually super durable. <laughs> I've, I've done this several times before. This is a really well-made needle. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Oh, I felt it there. 22, 22 bends. So, you know, you're probably going to kill your patient with anesthetic before the needle breaks. <laughs> no, but to be serious, really, truly, I mean, how concerned do you have to be? You have to be a little bit concerned. Was I bending at a huge distance? I mean, I was being pretty generous. Um, certainly putting enough of a bend on it that you're going to be able to access most of the areas that you need to access without much trouble. So very interesting. You will find that different gauge needles actually will be about the same. Now, actually in my my pre-test that I did, I tried a 25 gauge, 27 gauge, 30 gauge, and I bent them all. And perhaps I was being a little bit more aggressive on the bends, but I found it was about like eight or nine bends on average before they would fail. So this was really impressive actually. And sorry, because I ate up most of your day. Um, you're probably gonna have to wrap it up today because all those bends, but anyways, um, yeah, we'll move on to our next bit here and uh, hopefully learn some more about bending some needles. When would you choose to bend the needle? That's gonna be up to you. Now for myself, as I mentioned, there are tons of injections that I do this for. It's just about every injection, as a matter of fact. Now, one area that I'll do it would be for the inferior alveolar nerve block. So when I've got a mandible and I'm sitting next to a patient, typically when it's going to their left side, I don't bend it. Um, I have a fine time getting in there. When I come to the other side though, I do find it's just a little bit tricky to kind of get over into where I want to get to. So I will put a bit of a bend, kind of like this, which then allows me to get a little better angle um, into that left side in by the lingula. The other time that I will do this um, is actually for the PSA nerve block. Now I don't typically use a long needle, but again, when we're trying to get in here, up in by that um, pterygoid up here, we're going to get in behind the teeth. It's way easier to get that 45 degree angle, kind of upwards, inwards, and backwards when you bend the needle versus say bringing your hand way out here trying to stretch the cheek. So again, this is where it works to your advantage. Now, if we go back to the mandible, um, another area that I'll do this would be if I'm infiltrating lingually. So sometimes I'll be taking out, say, an impacted third molar. I will put a little bit of a bend in the needle. Same thing, again, usually a short needle though, which allows me then to get in kind of under where that mylo highway ridge would be, which is a great spot, again, to anesthetize these third molar roots, which are often perforating through the lingual plate. So if you take teeth out, um, you haven't taken my other course, that's a good tip uh, to get patients a little bit more numb. How else would you do this? Well, maybe you're doing a mental block, right? So same thing, you're sitting behind the patient and you want to get down into here, right? You can see how much easier that makes your life when you've got that bend on the needle um, versus trying to bring your hand way over here with a straight needle. You can sit pretty much comfortably just right where you're at. You don't have to reach across the patient um, and you can get to just about anywhere that you need to get to. So you'll have to play around with it a little bit. 
there are, you know, like an infinite number of injections that I could show you in the mouth with this. So of course I'm not going to demonstrate them all. Um, one more thing actually that's kind of important to think about, which I never used to think about much, but when you do look at the maxilla, um, it slopes in. So like the tissue will be kind of built out and we talk about this in some of our videos, but when you're going to infiltrate, again, if you have a bit of a bend on the needle, um, you know, you're going to get in closer to the bone, closer to the roots. So you don't want to be contacting bone, of course, and you want to have your bevel toward the bone. But, you know, versus coming straight in here, say if I don't have this bend on it. Oh, these are hard to unbend. And you know, actually, I did the 22 bends of the needle prior to this cut. And you know what's harder than breaking a needle, even though it took 22 bends? The harder thing is finding that needle when you drop it off the table onto your gray carpet. <laughs> you hear that expression, finding a needle in a haystack? Uh, this is the first time I've ever searched for a needle on the floor. So again, you know, maybe my mind just wasn't looking for what I was supposed to be looking for. But it was really hard. It took me longer to find that needle than it did to break it off in the video prior. So <clears throat> didn't want my kids stepping on it, but thankfully uh, I figured it out, found it. <clears throat> so again, like coming in straight on here for an infiltration, you might be going, say, like along the long axis of the tooth. But if we can get an appreciable angle for this, if we're going in the long axis with the canine, it's kind of the long axis there. Look at kind of where our needle is. Like it's way out in space, right? So if you put that bend in it again, then you kind of line up a little bit off axis with that canine, which is typically what I would do. That's going to bring it in much tighter um, to the bone. So just something to think about. <clears throat> again, it's going to greatly enhance your ability to inject comfortably in patients. And uh, ergonomics for you will be better as well, just from taking some of these tips into consideration. <laughs>